My name is Eric Gross. I'm a VP at Google. I've been here about 10 years. But I'm not from Google's infrastructure platforms team, which is what would, the sort of VP would normally come here. And I'm not even from Google's consumer hardware team, which is what would be concerned with IoT. I'm from Google's security team. And not, not the people with the blue shirts there that uh, protect the buildings, uh, the people that worry about the security of users' data. So you're probably wondering, what is this guy standing up here for? And I was asking the organizers that. I said, what, everybody in the room knows more about CPU design than I do. What could I say that would not be wasting their time? But I, I guess the view was, I've been seeing a bunch of interesting things over the last 10 years, and I'm currently somewhat interested in RISC-V. Why, why do these two things go together? So let me try to explain that. So my job has historically been trying to make sure that those billions of users of Google, you know, Gmail and Maps and all these different services, have data that's well protected. That's been my mission in life. And that's not an easy task because they have a lot of different needs. They have a lot of different scales at which that data should be protected. And some of them are up against fairly serious adversaries. So I should start by saying a little bit about who the adversaries are, because that's what might not be obvious to everyone here. It certainly was not obvious to me on day one when I came to Google. It wasn't really obvious to me until December 2009, when we had a, a remarkable incident with China that made the newspapers. You all may know that as the Aurora incident. So after a couple of years, here's my list of who our adversaries are. And you see the top ones, Russia, China, the, the five eyes, Israel. Those are the, the most skilled players in this game. If your favorite country is not on this list, don't feel offended. This is just my person, this is just a list of actors that I have, where I've personally seen the evidence for their behavior, right? So if someone's really good, then they're not on the list because we couldn't even detect them. But we've gotten pretty good at detection, as you can see. There's, okay, there's a lot of folks there. The flags are also interesting in that it's not, it's not just a country flag. There are flags of the actual groups within that country that are doing the various activities, you know. There's, NSA and PLA and GRU, et cetera. So that's, an, that's another interesting aspect we learned. Countries are not just this uniform thing where there's this one guy in charge and he orders everything that happens. The world's much more complicated than that. There are also adversaries on here that, like the Syrian Electronic Army, they're off in the corner, which are not major advanced players, but they're plenty good enough to totally compromise your company if you're not doing things properly. And then finally, I don't know if you can read that, it's, it says in the middle, don't attribute everything to enemy action. Sloth and ineptitude are pretty effective as well. The other thing to, to note here is many of these people may be your partners as well as your adversary. And, and so you just have to keep in mind that even though they're your, your partner, they have a different mission in the world than you do. And so don't be offended when sometimes they act to your benefit and sometimes they do things that, that you feel outraged by. Well, don't be outraged. Think of this like high school football. There's different teams and it's all, all fun and games. You know, everybody just does their thing. So, okay. So uh, this is what we're up against. If some of you are interested in science fiction, like I am, you'll probably be surprised when you think about it that there are no flags of mega corporations on here. That's what we used to think back in the early 80s, right? There'd be big cyber wars between companies. Don't see that. It's mostly state actors that are playing at the high levels. Not that there aren't capabilities of the various companies and universities represented in this room. A lot of you could do a lot of damage if you wanted to, but for some reason you're not motivated to in the same way. That's not your mission, great. Okay, so that's who we're up against. 
is it hopeless? No, actually it's not. We've been making lots of progress. So let me quickly point out three things that are effective against these adversaries. Number one, there's been a lot of progress in teaching people not to trust the network. You should always assume your network, like if you're in here, you're on Google Guest, right? That's how you're talking to the internet. You should assume that Google Guest is completely compromised by malware. That's a working assumption. But I even try to teach the people in, inside Google, when they're not on Google Guest, but on the Google corporate network, assume that is totally compromised by malware. I wouldn't say it's as compromised as Google Guest, but you should act as if it is, because you'll too often be proven right. So we've done a lot collectively as a community to improve things. There's a great article in today's Guardian newspaper about how they've gone over to full 100% HTTPS. That it's harder than it looks, but it's quite within uh, the realm of possibility. And there are various technical things uh, that have happened. You also have to encrypt the back ends as well as the link between the browser and the front end, but we're there. We're still making progress on end-to-end -end encryption, and that's personally where I'm spending all my time these days, is on that, both for storage and for communication. But that's basically a solved problem now. You can get perfectly effective means. That's fix one. Fix two is authentication, and this is the number one way we see people losing their data. So when, you know, in this fall, when there were lots of leaks coming out every day, that's pretty much all about people not doing authentication as well as they could. So everybody here, if you're not already, if you're a user of Gmail, say, or if you're a user of GitHub or something, you should already have one of these security keys in your pocket because this is the one method of authentication that we have observed defeats every one of those adversaries. We see, we see people in, adopt Gmail with other kinds of second factor or sometimes with just passwords. Those people get phished and their Gmail gets posted on the internet. And that's embarrassing, bad. So this is, you know, for, I think I now see somebody from our kind of community who said, oh, this FIDO standard looks interesting. Let me get a couple chips and glue them on and, and you can go to Amazon for $8, he'll ship you one of these security keys. So there's sort of no excuse not to be doing that. And then the third piece of advice is you should be staying patched up to date. It seems obvious, but too many people are not doing that. Okay, those three things together will protect you. Most of those have very little to do with risk five. I mean, in the Internet of Things, you better be sure that your system is capable of doing standard communication protocols, TLS. No fair having an engineer say, well, my CPU isn't quite powerful enough to do that. That, no, that's not acceptable. So be sure that your chips are not going to limit deployment of compromised networks. Be sure for something like security key that if you're thinking about supply chain and how much can you trust this tape out of your chip, that's an interesting aspect. And be sure, this is probably the biggest issue in the Internet of Things, that the software that you're talking about, including the firmware, can be updated because these objects are going to be out there for a long time. And we've already seen them close to taking down the internet because, you know, they're too easily abused. Okay, so those are, those are the easy things. And I'm going to then skip over lots of other security things that we worry about. Um, I like this old saying, the Vierne, no Vierne, you know, trust but verify. We've been talking a little this morning about verification, so let me hammer on one of those things that is, I think, more closely related to, to this audience. Rowhammer. Anybody heard of Rowhammer? So in the, good. So, I, so I'm saying I learned a lot about security in December 2009 and the year or two following that. Then I learned some more things about security in the fall of 2014 when Rowhammer uh, came out. Well, I guess we didn't actually go public until March, but you know, we were, all of our research basically was done in the fall and, and then we were carefully rolling out the fixes across all of our own machines, and there are a lot of machines here at Google, and notifying all of the various other stakeholders in the world that needed to know and adapt before it went completely public. That takes a long time. 
I, for those of you who didn't just raise your hand, uh, basically the idea is, I mean, what we figured out in fall of 2014 is if you spray all of memory with page tables and then execute this little loop here, some bits in memory will flip. And when one of them flips, you will probably have just gotten access to other processes address space that can be exploited. And we showed we could become root on all these machines that we thought were really safe. I mean, those, you know, Chromebook, that's, that was the most secure machine I knew how to build. And even that we, we could compromise. So we went into overdrive, we fixed all these problems uh, that, as I say, took a while. But one of the lessons for me coming out of this was the disclosure process in the hardware community is dramatically different than in the software community. It turns out this sort of already known to some experts in the field two years previously, but the word hadn't gotten out because the, the, the rules are different there than here. So in Google's disclosure policy, when we find a vulnerability, we notify the people that are in a position to fix that problem this is typically the software vendor and possibly other players, you know, it depends on how complicated the situation is. And a, a clock starts running and they have 90 days and they know this up front. They have 90 days to decide what they're going to say to their customer base. Hopefully that's, they figure out a patch, they automatically distribute the patch. And by the time the vulnerability goes public, everybody's already patched more or less. I mean, obviously there are going to be some people who refuse to patch. Okay. They're screwed. But for the most part, this 90 day process works pretty effectively. In particular, it works better than the older process where we notify a vendor and years later, if ever they get around to patching it. I mean, this is, this is some of the ways some of these major breaches have happened is because in fact, it wasn't a zero day. The vendor had already been notified, but they were taking forever to come up with a patch because they just didn't feel there was no incentive for them to do so. So that's our 90 day policy. We actually also have a policy that when we discover the vulnerability, because we've been monitoring these adversaries I was talking about, and we see that they're actively exploiting it against our users. When that happens, we tell the vendor and we say, yeah, but you don't have 90 days. This is actively in the wild being used against people and you have seven days and then we're going to go public. So in a case like that, they probably have time to get some kind of a patch, but even if they don't have time to get a patch, they at least have time to figure out here's the best mitigation that you have. So if you're worried that you're a target of this vulnerability, here's what you should be doing. Okay. That's the way we do things in the software industry. In the hardware industry, it seems to be a different process where, Hardware is more difficult to fix than software in some regards. And realistically, it's tough to sweep through and, and swap out all of the machines. I get that. I mean, this is a place where we buy machines in units of megawatts. So I get that. It's hard. But there has to be a solution. And so that's the kind of work that went on with Rowhammer. We would figure out without replacing every RAM stick in our inventory, you know, what, how do we protect against these kinds of things? This is a, a situation I would say where there's not yet a real resolution. And I would love to hear from anybody here about what you think is the right way to do vulnerability disclosure in this new world. So that's interesting. I actually had a, an earlier understanding of this a little bit, uh, a few years earlier in, in 2011, I don't know if anybody was here was associated with this. We had the great BIOS lockdown. Anybody remember in patching BIOS? Okay. In 2011, there was credible concern that through an accident, something might happen that would cause lots of machines. By that, I'm thinking, you know, like say most PCs, routers, you know, a lot of machines would simultaneously get their BIOS uh, zeroed out or, or, you know, essentially the machines would get bricked until you can reach in and replace the flash part. And that would be difficult. There just aren't enough flash parts around and there aren't enough people that know how to 
pull this out and put that in and how to burn flash, et cetera. So that was a real concern. And the industry got together and came up with ways to better lock down the BIOS. So that the update process had a li little bit more of a speed bump than where the world was up until then. And I thought that was a, that was a good joint effort of the people that are looking at the threats and the people that have the power to actually fix our hardware ecosystem. But then some of the, the outcomes of this wound up locking down systems in not just to make it hard for an adversary to brick your device, but made it hard for the owner of the device to be still in control of their device. And some of those proprietary lock-in things really, I think, harmed that potential for our hardware, software ecosystem to work better together. There were, there were some hard feelings after that. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is part of what shifted my attention. Let me say that these kinds of problems are not anywhere near the top of the list of concerns when I'm worrying about protecting a billion people. That's, that's not where it is. You really got to be working on things like authentication first. I mean, all those matter way more than, than, than what CPU and firmware is on the device. But ultimately, as you fix those things, and most of those billion people are protected that way, these adversaries have a very deep bench. They have a lot of different methods for attacking their targets. As the easy things become harder to use, they will slide along and use some of the slightly more difficult things. We're not there yet, don't worry, we still have years. The easy things are still plenty for them. So that's why I felt it was the only responsible way to give this talk is to first tell you, do those three things first because <laughs> really, you gotta get to those first. But another thing I learned out of the China incident and then is uh, very nicely described by Rob Joyce. He's the head of the tailored access operations at the NSA. He gave a talk at a conference here, uh, Enigma, called Disrupting Nation State Hackers. And basically, he gave us a talk where he said, my guys are pretty good. He said, they can break into most systems. Let me tell you some of the elementary things that they do that you guys out there are defenseless against. You should really get better. <laughs> Clean up your act here. So in effect, what he's saying is his team studies what's out there in the world. They, they look at what you think you have deployed in your network. That is by policy and configuration and so forth. You think you know what technologies you're using. His team looks at what technologies you're actually using. And he says, we'll know the security functionality better than the people who designed the device. They won't know everything about the device, but they're really focusing in on the security of that device. They're looking for the weaknesses in the chips and in the software and in the way the software's configured and they're going to be good at going after those weaknesses. And, and it's sort of no mercy, right? I mean, like he says, sometimes you'll call up your tech support people and they'll say, yeah, we have to get in to fix this thing for you. Here, turn off the security thing for, for an hour and we'll come in and fix it and then you turn it back on. He said, no. His guys are just there quietly knocking on the door. And when you turn off that security for an hour, they're in, they do their stuff and they disappear and you'll never know that you've been compromised permanently. So this is what we're up against. And I believe in order to make progress on this one beyond the kinds of things I was just talking about, we're going to need to address this problem of complexity. As, as I say, complexity is the enemy of security. This goes back, I don't know, probably probably before I was born, I, I don't have the reference to the earliest uh, uh, use of it, but at any rate, what's clear to me is our systems today are just too complicated. And in particular, at the hardware level, they're not only very complicated, they're undocumented. And so it's very hard for those of us in security to make progress because it, it's, there's just too much reverse engineering involved. It's just crazy. And, and I say that, from a position where, you know, we have reasonable access to information, right? I mean, usually if Google calls up, a chip vendor is interested in, in being cooperative. So I'm not saying that 
there's anything evil going on here. It's just th those clear documents don't exist. And the designs are inherently very complicated because of history. So part of the answer, as, as we uh, saw that, that great talk first thing in the morning, uh, uh, Taylor, wherever you are, that I really love that. Part of the answer, I think, is open source, because that's a place where, you know, it may not be well documented, but if you've got the source code, you can, that's ultimately the documentation. So I'm happy with that. But remember that that iceberg, I mean, we got to prune. We cannot have a little bit of open source and then a dependency base like that. That makes, that means we're still going to be very complicated. And it's just, it's always going to be dangerous. You should be scared if your adversary knows more about your technology than you do. So the only way I see to make progress on that is to, not for everything, but for the places where we need really strong security, we need to have a much smaller, simpler, more understandable basis. OK, so there's open source. And I work a lot on that because I'm a software guy. So suppose for the sake of argument, we made progress on that. There's still below that, there's still firmware and there are chips. And that's scary. So that's why I've been interested in RISC-V. OK, firmware. Um, I should say, because this sounds a lot like doom and gloom, I do talk with some folks from the espionage world, and this firmware stuff is maybe a little bit overrated in, in the sense of approximate security risk. They tell me, yes, we can demonstrate in the lab, break into machines through the firmware approach, but that stuff is incredibly hard to use in real life because it's so specific. Unless you're planning to, to compromise vast classes of machines, you know, like, like millions of machines at once or something, if you're just targeting an individual, it's really hard to deploy these firmware attacks against them. They're just so unreliable and so forth. You have to, ah, it's too hard. We use easy things instead. Okay, so we have plenty of time to work on this, but we don't, I don't believe we have forever to work on this. And then there's the mysterious chips. So, I mean, who knows what's inside these pieces of silicon? Uh, when the President's Commission on Cybersecurity came to town, I was asked to testify and, I, and they asked me, you know, what's the one thing you really want the next administration to fix? And I said, well, there's lots of things that'd be nice for Washington to fix, but a lot of those we can do for ourselves, but there's one thing we can't do for ourselves. When big companies get orders and get and in particular, the judge writes a gag order saying, you know, you must do the following and you're not allowed to tell anybody about it. That really is bad because there's no way we can convince our global customer base that we're not doing something evil when they know that it's possible we could be ordered to do evil and not be allowed to talk about it. So the one thing I really wish <laughs> they would do is, you know, the end with all these infinite time gag orders. that. I don't mind gag orders if they expire after six months or something. That's There's a way then for the public to keep some control on governments that are getting too much out of hand. But how does that come to chips? I'm saying, if we don't know what's in the chip, there could be vulnerabilities that we don't know about. And it's, again, it's not even required, it doesn't require back doors put in by governments. It's enough just that the design was not as strong as intended. I mean, row hammer again. Good example. Everybody involved was trying to do exactly the right thing. It just turned out there was a vulnerability. It was even recognized by the hardware verification people that these things could happen, but they couldn't see how to use that to make an exploitable security vulnerability. So unless we get more openness, we're not going to solve these security problems, and they're pretty bad. So I've sort of changed my focus from protecting billions of people to protecting sysadmins. I mean, we see the espionage people, when they're really up against a tough target, they go after the sysadmin because he's got access to lots of other things. They don't care about him in particular. They care about what he has access to. So I'm now sort of focused on the more technical person who's prepared to, who for some reason cares about security and is prepared to do a little bit of extra work. This is not for the billion users case. OK. So suppose you're paranoid and you want to pick a platform for yourself, like a workstation. What would you use? Today, the 
only practical choice I have, I think, is x86. I, I mean, how many? Okay, there's ARM, but as we were hearing earlier, you know, that's that doesn't get us any farther away from lawyers than than with x86. So okay, so effectively, my only choice is x86, and I'm doing that. You know, last week I was installing cubes on a nut kit, and yes, I first did the BIOS upgrade before I did the OS install. By the way, the BIOS upgrade was harder to do than the OS install. I don't know why. And it's not harder because it involved opening up the box and moving a jumper or a set screw or something. It was just, you know, it meant using tools from the DOS era. It's just amazing. So, okay, whatever. Software patching, remember guys, we gotta be able to do better. The average person was not going to be able to update their BIOS. Okay, but I did that. Uh, and that's working. There are some subtleties even here that might interest you. So for example, on this little box, it's a nice small thing I can carry around with me. So there are certain advantages in physical security, but that means there's no PS2 port on it. The keyboard plugs into the USB port. Those of you in security will realize that's a really big problem because if the keyboard in DOM0 is plugged into USB, you better not let random other devices also plug into USB. So I mean, there are system design issues here that influence what you can possibly do in security, even when you're trying really hard, like, like Joanna's team does. I'm also um, a student of uh, Ron Minnick and, and others trying to learn how I can build a machine with no binary blobs. It's pretty hard. We have to pick some old hardware. There's some old AMD-based uh, motherboard, but we're working, right? That's working, right? We've got core boot and U root and all that. And so I finally, I have a nice workstation class machine where I think I know all the software running on it. That's a nice feeling. I'm, I mean, I might not be right, and there's maybe more software than I can totally understand, but I have a chance of getting there. So that's nice. But long term, there's so much going on in x86. If you read Joanna's paper, you'll, x86 is considered harmful. You'll see th that's just a dead end street. So I'm actually looking more at the power machines. I'm probably one of the only people in the room that signed up for one of these Talos. <laughs> ah, another person, excellent, good. I don't think we're gonna get the crowdsourcing <laughs> up to its goal. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, Google is also interested in this. So back in the server rooms, I expect we'll have some power machines. So that's a credible alternative. But if, though, if that doesn't work out, my only remaining option, as far as I can see, is RISC-V. So that's why, I'm, that's why I'm interested. If you guys can keep this system open and don't make it too complicated, then I think you have a chance of being a preferred secure platform, and that would be really exciting. There are, when I say, if you can keep it simple, that's, I know that's hard, right? How many network protocols have simple in the name? And they started out simple, but they create features over time. So just beware. Uh, Ron and I have been talking about some proposals about supervisor callback to firmware and stuff, and I just, I'm just pulling out my hair. Ah. It gets really hard to do a good security analysis if you add more and more features. The interactions just get really complicated, so please be careful. So let me just say, there are some features that do look appealing to me, like the, uh, the capability people, right? Tag memory have an interesting proposal where they would like to put their coprocessor alongside a RISC-V, and some of those features would actually let us do security analysis in a better way than what we have otherwise. So, so when I say no features, I don't really mean don't ever add any features, just try to keep it to a dull roar. All right, so thanks, that's, that's where I am. This is, this is uh, the end. Uh, I'll take a couple questions if there's any time, but bottom line, yes, we're up against serious adversaries. No, we don't despair, but they're hard problems. Thanks. I see a question here microphone or or maybe you can just walk over to the mic there I think I heard there's an overflow room so we that's why we like to use a mic you mentioned earlier a great BIOS lockdown of 2011 but I can't find any information about that on the internet uh, do you have any more keywords like we we could use to find out more information later <sighs> sorry no I don't remember that ever really hitting the press but there was a lot of work going on.
yeah, talk, I mean, I, I don't know. But we're just looking for basically, does the, what does it take to update the BIOS? You know, is there some password protection or, you know, what, what is it? Does it need a jumper? That, that's basically what we're talking about. We just wanted to make sure that enough machines were protected so that no matter what was running at the OS level, you couldn't wipe out the BIOS simultaneously across, let's say, you know, 100 million machines or 400 million machines, because that's what would be hard to recover from. If it was only, if you only wipe out 20% of the machines in the US, yeah, we could probably survive, that's fine. Okay, next. Hi, Jan Gray, Gray Research. About a year and a half ago, something came out of Google called Project Vault, which had a couple of, um, one embodiment was an open risk 1200 soft FPGA implementation. What happened to Project Vault? And can you imagine a really, really tiny risk five Project Vault like thing where, particularly if it's in an FPGA, you don't have to trust that the vendor fabbed the SOC and didn't sneak something into it. Thank right. you. Right. I don't, I'm not the best one to answer that. Dom? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Project Vault. Um, well, if we were to do it again today, we would do it with a Risk V core because de facto standard. Um, one could imagine something like that being built, though, you know, no promises. Um, come find me later and we can talk more about Project Vault and what kind of stuff it could support. Great. And there are some other um, chip development things internally where we're trying to make very secure silicon that we can trust and that can form a, a basis for, um, you know, from boot level on up across all the machines in our fleet and and in and protecting our users and so forth. So yes, that's we're still working that kind of thing. Next, hey uh, Josh Lifton from Crowd Supply. Um, you right at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that most of the actors you're up against are state actors. Uh, then later, you mentioned yeah. Cubes OS and uh, you know. Uh, mystery chips, and obviously there's the Intel management engine that keeps us fights against. Um, are those companies like like Intel in particular? Are they just colluding uh, via gag orders, or or are they really they're really not being seen as actors themselves? I have zero evidence or indication that a company like Intel is doing something nefarious with x86 at the behest of some government. So. Let me, let me correct that record if that was the impression. No, no, I, I, that's, but that was the question. I also have no way to know if it were happening. So yeah. that's why, although you may not have a chip that's quite as highly performant. I mean, the power chips are pretty performant, so that's not really an issue. But, but a RISC-V chip might be using such processes that it's not really competing with the high-end Intel chip. But for some kind of local trusted computing base. So when you discover you've been compromised and you pull back to a few machines that you know you can trust, it's kind of nice to have some that were designed totally in the open. That's that's the point that I'm getting at. Thanks. Thanks for helping me clarify. I noticed when we walk outside is Google employees can buy cables or do things. Uh, how do you protect with respect to security that now we have smart cables, you can have micros and yeah. connector and it, uh, that's a lot easier to do something evil yeah. than uh, a processor design. And if I get evil stuff in a cable, I got you. Very true. And if you replace the cable with wireless, you might be worse off. So yeah. Uh, well, one concrete thing we do is we hand our employees, you know, they're going off Christmas vacation or something. We say, you know, when you go to the airport and your phone's not charged, don't just plug into this USB charger at this kiosk, that's not a good idea. We actually give them a cable that defaults to DC power only, and you push a button to turn on the data parts of the cable. So that it is still a USB data cable, I mean, uh, yes, a USB data cable, but it, it can be used to charge even when you're desperate in the airport. Just telling people it's dangerous to plug in, well, I mean, you know, they're in the airport, their phone's dead. They, they got to get their work done. So, so we try always to pick security advice and policies that our sort of reasonable people will be able to adopt. Very good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Eric.